Hey, you guys, this is Josh and Carolyn with Homesteading Family, and welcome to this week's episode of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. This week, we're going to be talking about preserving vegetables and fruits by root cellaring. Awesome. All right, so we're continuing on with the series on food preservation. Yeah, and I'm excited about this one. This is a good one. It really is, um, but it's a it's a tough one to tackle in a lot of ways. Uh huh. <clears throat> and that is root cellaring. Yeah. We're going to be covering the basics of root cellaring today. What you need to know, and some alternatives because a lot of us don't have an actual root cellar, and that that's why a lot of people don't tackle it. I think is there is some infrastructure required. We still don't <clears throat> have a root cellar, but we have been <clears throat> cellaring vegetables for a long time. That's right. So we're going to give you a rundown on the basics, what you need, and then some alternatives to help you get through until you get to that point right. of an actual root cellar. Hey, but before we do that, we need to catch up a little bit yeah. and answer a question. So what is going on? Ooh, well, first, I want to let everybody know that Grandma Jeannie <clears throat> is doing better. Much better. She yep. is improving. She's still not home yet, but she is improving. So I know a lot of you guys... Um, have expressed really, you know, get well soon wishes to her. And we're so thankful for that. And I'm passing yeah. those along, but she is doing much better. Um, but then aside from that, we're actually getting ready for a trip. Yep. Yay. We, we get are. to take a little trip coming up here. And so, of course, when you're leaving <clears throat> the homestead, there are things that need to get done before you leave, especially when you're leaving kind of for us at the trailing end of harvest season. Yep, trailing end of harvest season. We're getting ready for, for winter. Mm -hmm. And we got a big household we're leaving behind for a little bit. Yeah, so we've been kind of busy with those preparations. Yeah, yeah. Pretty what about much, you? Pretty much same, same here. Thing? Yeah, you know, <laughs> just visiting on grandma and we're working away. We've gotten some... Um, Pasture reseeded mm -hmm. and an area, if you guys remember, we dug out the pond, the large pond, and we had a lot of soil, like an acre of soil we had to spread out. That finally dried out. We got that graded and disked and harrowed and seeded and seeding a few other areas, doing a fall seeding here yeah. to try to get a start on some of these areas. And just a lot of, it's been a lot of infrastructure this work. The infrastructure, if you guys have been following along this yeah. year. <clears throat> and so we're um, starting to wrap all of that up. Yeah, there's a lot going on. I think we're going to be getting a roof on the addition here really soon. And so we will be yep. really ready for some weather to come in. Yeah, and then we can start on the inside, start on the electrical and stuff That's like that. Very exciting. So, so really, lots of things going on. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but hey, let's dive right in. We've got okay. a question for the question day. Question for the day <clears throat> from <clears throat> Sofast on the Preservation 101 video, the <clears throat> intro into canning. Mm -hmm. Ask, do you freeze most of your meat products? If so, what is your backup if electricity goes out other than a generator? Okay, so I don't know if I'm totally clear on the nature of that question, but yes, we do freeze most of our meat. We have several large freezers. I saw another question was asking how many. We've got at least four large mm -hmm. chest freezers. Uh, we freeze some other things too. Mm -hmm. But yes, we freeze most of our meat and the backup generators always cover that as far as like backing up that meat supply. Or we, we've never, never mm -hmm. lost a uh, freezer. That does happen. Excuse you do me. have to be careful. You need to be attentive of them. And certainly if the power goes out, you need to be watching them even more carefully and um, <clears throat> making sure that your generators are working, they're ready, you've got all the plugs you need, you've got fuel, everything else. So mm -hmm. on that side, that is the backup. Yeah. Um, you know, and we just have to take care of that and be prepared for it. So we are. Now, on the other side of being backed up, like, are we backing up our meat supply in mm. case something happens and we had a failure? Then, yes, we do keep a, a bit, not a ton, a bit of canned meat there yeah. um, for convenience, for easy meals. And, and, um, and yes, that is an additional backup supply. And in fact, we have actually talked about... Um, beefing that up, you know, <laughs> at times and, and getting a little larger supply in there, something to do uh, to add on to for, for those kind of reserves, because it is nice to have those reserves. It really is. And, you know, <clears throat> canning meat is actually really, really easy. I know it's very intimidating to a lot of people, but it's a very easy thing to can yeah. as far as the prep work. So it's a great way to go. But you also have dehydrating meat. You could do that, freeze drying. Yeah. 
um, curing. Of course, you've got some cured meats yeah. to make them shelf stable, and then they can be in a root cellar type environment, yep. right? We're going to be talking about that. So, And that's something we do plan to tackle. I mm -hmm. want to tackle personally. I guess for me, that's more the culinary side, Yeah. though building the skill of that preservation without uh, um, electricity or mm -hmm. some of the other methods is a good skill we want to add eventually, but right. it hasn't hit the priority list yet. Good. Yeah, very good. Good question. All right. <clears throat> so let's dive in here. We're talking about root cellaring today. We are. And as Carolyn was saying, we don't have an actual technical root cellar. We actually are working towards building one. We need a really large one. <laughs> um, and so... Well, and let me, let me just put this in context because I meant to say that too. You're talking about the number of freezers that we have. For those of you who don't know us... We have a 13 members in the household right. right now. So we're feeding a lot of people. We have grandma and grandpa on the property. They're here for quite a few meals. You know, so depending we, we on actually the week. have 15 people full time on the property. On the property. Yep. And so, <clears throat> and then of course we have a lot of guests in and out. So we're often feeding, you know, 17, 18, 19 people sure. at a meal. So we have a lot more food requirements than say a four person household does. Right. So just want to put that into context because yes, we need a really big root cellar, but it's for a large number of people. Well, and we're also for our environment because a lot of root cellaring crops, a lot of storage mm -hmm. crops do well in our environment. And yeah. so it makes a lot of sense to be moving towards growing more of those. Yes. It's easier preservation. Mm -hmm. But like we're going to talk about here, um, it's, it's a large space that needs to be created and built into the earth. Yeah. And so that's a larger project to tackle that's that's coming on. Now, a lot of you don't need something that large, and so there's a lot of ways to go about it. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess we'll get to that. We'll start digging in here. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I got a frog in my throat, I think. <laughs> um, well, let's just dive right in. What is root cellaring? Okay, so root cellaring is creating an environment where food keeps for a really long time, which usually means controlling the temperature in, and the humidity or finding a place that kind of does that for you to allow food to keep without any processing in its natural form for mm -hmm. a long time. And so there's there's a the most standard way we would do that would be in the earth. Right. For a specific reason. You want right. to cover that? Why, why root cellars mm -hmm. are generally down in the ground? Well, because of temperature <clears throat> control. When you're right. down in the ground, you're dropping that temperature. You're cooler. Right. And you're also stable temperature-wise. It doesn't fluctuate because the insulation of the earth. The other thing, though, is that the earth is moist. Mm -hmm. There's moisture down in there. So you have that humid, more humid environment. It's right. also easier to keep that humidity in, um, especially if you're in a dry place because you have all that insulation. Well, and it's a, it's a great resource from that angle because pretty much anywhere that you have earth, mm -hmm. you can create storage. You just have to yeah. get down deep enough. If you're in a cold environment, you've got to get down below your freezing depth. Mm -hmm. And even in a hot environment, you can get down deep enough to keep things cool at yeah. that, that general 50, 55 degrees, which is your soil temperature when you get down there. And so that becomes, it takes no energy to do that besides building it. Yeah. yeah. But again, we're going to say that you don't have to have a technical root cellar in order to actually take advantage of some of these methods. Right. It does make things a lot easier. Well, and you do. <laughs> well it makes things a lot easier and you're going to be able to store things a lot longer in the right conditions. Right. Um, but we'll cover towards the end of this, you know, some other things that you can do mm -hmm. and they may not be ideal conditions, but... Uh, you can put up a lot of food mimicking root cellaring in other environments. And these are exactly <laughs> the things that we've done over right. the last yep. decade and or it's so gotten to us do this. by very, very well. Yeah, it has. Okay, so um, let's just dive into kind of we've been covering pros and cons on right. these topics. So what are some of the pros for root cellaring? Okay, so one of the <laughs> top pros for me, for somebody who's generally responsible for bringing in a huge amount of food and having it stored for the winter is that it is fast. <laughs> you bring it in and you park it somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have the right environment, you're not processing, you're not chopping, peeling, cooking, any of that, that all comes later. And so that is just a major benefit to somebody <laughs> who's trying to actually eat predominantly mm -hmm. off of your food storage. So right. fast is a really big one. 
Easy is the next one, right? It's it's, it's not lot, very hard. Yeah, when you're easier, once you have the space set up, mm -hmm. it's one of the easiest preservation methods because there's not much to do but to harvest and yeah. prep the vegetables. A lot of them got to be cured properly, right? And then stored. Yeah, yeah. Of course, it's also <laughs> done correctly or done. There are ways that you can root cellar with a lot of electricity, but in general, it is your low energy. It has very low energy right. power costs related to it. You're not usually running anything except for maybe a light to see where you're going in your root cellar, right? right. Maybe a fan. Mm -hmm. um, and then a really, really great thing that has become more and more important to me as we live in the far north of Idaho and have these long, dark, snowy, cold winters is that it keeps food fresh. Mm -hmm. They're in their same condition, or that at least they're still fresh. You haven't cooked them, you haven't <clears throat> processed them or changed their shape. So you can still go get fresh food to right. eat you know, even when the garden is under feet of snow. Right. So that's really good. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Now there are a few cons, actually not a lot, but there are a few reasons why, you know, why it's a challenge or why you might not do it. Well, and the first one we've been talking about right. is the, the setup, infrastructure. Right, the infrastructure. Needs. You've got to get down into the earth. So you've got to move earth. You've got yeah. to build something. And of course, if you're building a structure that's going to go under earth, uh, it needs to be a hefty structure. And we're not getting into how to build a root cellar, but um, it's a major project to take on. And the larger the amount you're trying to store in it, the larger it has to be. Yeah. And now there are a lot of alternatives and other methods, which we will cover. We'll, we'll gloss mm -hmm. over a little bit here. But to do root cellaring right, it's, it's a big project to tackle and, mm -hmm. and has a bit of expense to get going. Another con that a lot of people don't realize, because we don't have a lot of experience with root cellaring in our culture mm -hmm. generally at this point, is that the, your root cellar and the things inside of it need to be maintained throughout their storage life. Yep. You've heard that, um, you know, one bad apple will spoil the whole batch, that yep. saying. That comes right. exactly from root cellaring, from cellaring things, is you have to be going through your stores, making sure nothing's going bad using up the things that are getting old looking and, and continually maintaining them. And by continually, I'm talking on a weekly basis. You need to be getting in and checking on your stores. So there is an ongoing, you know, it's not like canning where you just stick it on your shelf and it's done. Right. It's not that, while it's stable, and it's not that shelf stable as, right. as what we're used to. And we're just not used to that in our culture. And in the homestay and lifestyle, there's a lot of different things like that that you, you have to bring in a, a whole nother skill and a whole nother yeah. task, so to speak. Yeah. And this is definitely one that while it's worth doing, yeah, you've got to get in there and you've got to be a part of things. Well, and, and that, checking on it. That not stable <clears throat> is really one other con is that, you know, your your fruits are all going to eventually go bad in a root cellar. They're going to mold. There's going to shrivel. They're going to mm -hmm. get old. And so, again, they're not in that stable condition like a canned good yeah. that might just sit there and last or a freeze dried good that's going to last, you know, 20 years in the same state, essentially. Um you, you know, it's changing and it is going bad eventually. Right. So, you know, it's not long-term stable. Right. Yeah. So, but when you provide ideal conditions, things mm -hmm. can last a really, really long time. So yeah. we're going to do a rundown here on the ideal conditions mm -hmm. of root cellar. And if you were to build one and what your goals are for, right. for different foods, because for different foods, there's different ideals mm -hmm. in what you want. And then we'll get on to some of the alternatives that just about any of us can apply in some fashion to start cellaring in your own home and your own property as you move toward maybe an eventual real traditional root cellar. Yeah, like so many <laughs> things on the homestead, you have ideal and you have practical. And, the, and yeah. we want to aim for ideal, but we don't want to get hung up on ideal to the point that we're not even doing it and not hitting practical. There, Yeah, and there really is very little ideal. And I think in today's world where we're taught so many industrial methods right. that are so technical and so precise, and if we try to follow those, well, we're never going to do something. We're never going to get there mm -hmm. and make it happen. And there is a lot of in-between. While it mm -hmm. might not be ideal, well, yes, things may not store as long, you can still store things. You can still make things happen, even outside of the root cellar discussion. Right. If we're willing to let go of ideal and kind of figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. So, um, okay. so let's dive in though. This is just going to be some good information about what you can keep in the, in the conditions that you need to be able to keep it in, in root cellaring. Okay, great. And so you want to start with uh, cold and very moist. Yeah. So the first <laughs> class is the cold and ver very moist. And when we're talking about cold, we're talking 32 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, I mean, you're talking your refrigerator cooler right. sort of range. Yep. 
but very, very high humidity, 90 to 95% humidity. Realistically, the way to get this is going to be having your vegetables in some sort of damp medium. Sand, sawdust, historically is very common. Mm -hmm. Leaves, damp leaves, not wet, but damp. And that's the way you're gonna keep that 90 to 95% humidity in an area. And likewise, to keep it that cool because the earth actually isn't that cool. Mm -hmm. So in this one, there is some management because you've gotta let that cold night air in. Yeah. You've gotta have air movement and get cold air in there to, to maintain these levels. Right. Yeah. So the things that store really well under, this con under these conditions are gonna be things like carrots, beets, parsnips, turnips, celery, leeks, and you can even store broccoli and Brussels sprouts like this mm -hmm. for short term. You're not going to get the months and months that the other ones are, but if right. they are stored properly, you can still be eating delicious crisp carrots six months from now out of your root cellar. Right. It should be great. They should be in great condition by the time you're starting to get your spring carrots coming on. Yep. So it's really good. Good. Okay. So the next one we're going to talk about is cold and moist. So mm -hmm. same temperature levels, yeah. but the humidity levels don't need to be as high. Right. So we're talking still that 32 to 40 degree mm -hmm. range, but now we're in the 80 to 90 percent humidity. Mm -hmm. That's still quite a bit that's still, more humid. Just, that's just pretty moist. That's yeah. pretty moist. Just that's more, more humid. Just than a little more tolerant. Your room level, but you know, you think about root cellars in the ground in dirt, you're gonna be holding moisture in there pretty mm -hmm. well. So you right. may have to add a little bit, but the things that would be in that range and would store really well there are gonna be potatoes, cabbage, apples, grapes, oranges, pears. Some of those things we don't even think about root cellaring mm -hmm. in our culture right now, but historically they have been cellared for long periods of time. Right in that kind of storage. I mean, grapes, how lovely would it be to go get a bunch of grapes? But if you've ever seen, you know, in Italy, they used to have these like chandelier looking things with bunches of grapes hanging off of them in their root cellar areas. And they would stay good for months that way. And so you so could cool. still have fresh grapes down your root yeah. cellar. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it's very, I love very it. cool. One mm -hmm. thing to note in these that makes me think on this list too, is just there, there are some things that need to not be stored together. Right. Like, like the apples and potatoes right. cause a problem. I forget which way it goes right yeah. at the moment. Do you remember what No, I don't offhand. One of them off gas is something that makes the other one go bad. Yeah, generally and, you want to keep your fruits and your roots separate. Right. Yeah. Yep, good Good rule of thumb there. Yeah. So that's something you want to research if you're looking at applying some of these or trying to get this going. You definitely want to do some research and understand what works well together. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, the next environment we're talking about is cool. So we're warming up here a little bit, uh, 40 to 50 degrees. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet still moist, still up in that 80, you know, 80 percentile yeah. moisture level. Absolutely. And these are some really exciting ones for a lot of people because they're cucumbers, sweet peppers, watermelons and cantaloupe ripe tomatoes. Did you know these things can store for up to two and three months pretty easily in great condition if you can give them yeah. this environment? I mean, how nice to go grab some sweet peppers, right? But 40 to 50 degrees, I mean, you're kind of in refrigerator range right there, but you're, you know, maybe a little warmer than your yeah, average yeah, refrigerator. You're, yeah, you're, you're getting a little warmer in the refrigerator. You're still pretty cool. But um, you're pretty cool, but you're pretty high humidity, and that's yeah. the important And thing. you're still going to have to get some cool air in there at night. You're still going to have to manage that. That's yeah. not that 50 to 55 degrees, Yeah. that, <clears throat> that earth temperature. So there's right. still some cooling off that needs to happen, right? right. Okay. <clears throat> okay, now we're moving. Now we're going back to that cold but drier, you know, I don't really think of this as dry, but in terms of you know, crop storage, yeah. you cool and dry that 32 to 50 degrees. This is quite a wide, wide range, yeah. um, but lower humidity, the 60% tile right. of humidity. Yeah, so that's that's considered dry, right? Drier it, when it comes to, food. to food storage, yeah. but it's still higher <laughs> than your average room household humidity. Right. And that's going to be your onions and your garlic. That's where those are going to store really, really well. Right. Is in that that kind of cool, very cool. It's really quite cold, actually, 32 to 50. You know. Yeah, there's just a high tolerance there. And they're mm -hmm. going to do best on, on these closer to that, you know, 32. Yeah. Not You don't want to freeze because that's not going to damage them. But any of these things that can take those temperatures, the cooler, the better. Yeah. Before you get to freezing, they're going to hold longer, assuming you've got your humidity in a good 
good range. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah. And so next we've got now what we're moving on to a moderately warm. We wouldn't call it warm, but but moving up in temperature to fifty to sixty degrees. Right. And uh, still in that sixty percent humidity right. level. Yeah, and that's things like your pumpkins and your winter squash. Your sweet potatoes and green tomatoes will hold for a long time at that temperature. Right. And so you can tell just, just by those temperatures right there what things are going to be easier to get started with. Yes. You know, pumpkins, winter squash, if you don't have ideal conditions, uh, the sweet potatoes, greening tomatoes, even onions and garlic, those things start moving towards things that you can get started with really easily mm -hmm. without ideal conditions because that temperature range is a bit higher. Right, exactly. <laughs> so here we're talking about storing things in this really cool temperature for a lot of them. Mm -hmm. But if you can get close to that, you can still store things for a long time. It's just not going to store as long. Right. right. So so moving away from that ideal, yeah. if you go to, and this is why root cellars work, because your soil temperature is 50 to 55 degrees. Right. And so that is a good, you can you can do all of this within that. It may yeah. not be ideal for everything, but you can, that temperature range will get you there real close. Right. And can work across the board for almost everything here that we're talking about. So you may not have really crisp, delicious carrots for those six months, but would you be happy to have them for three months yeah. to get you through oh, in a man. lot of places? The, yeah, yeah, the answer is absolutely yeah. yes. I would love that. Yeah, well, and the winter squashes. We've gotten winter squashes six months. Oh, easily. In, that, in, that, in the in, kitchen. Yeah, in that 60 you know, degree temperature. Yeah. 60, 65 degrees. That, that's getting into varietals and yeah. varieties that do real well, but you can still go a long, long way. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that we're kind of moving out of that. We're talking about that ideal. And so now we're talking, okay, you could do this 55 is a good temperature mm -hmm. average. But say we just can't get to the root cellar. You know, we still aren't going to get that hole in the ground and get a technical root cellar built. We're not ready yet. What are things that people can do? We've done a lot over the years yes. to, to um, make do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can, one thing that we've done that's worked really well for us is using coolers in a cold space, mm -hmm. yep. right? So we've been able to keep apples in our uninsulated garage here where it gets very, very cold, but we have them inside a cooler and we've been able to keep them good all the way until the following March and even into yeah, April. Yeah, six, six months. Yeah. yeah. In yeah. non-ideal conditions. And those are just in coolers, in big coolers. Right. Just put right in there, cracked open just a little bit. So you can find a space that will stay cool, but give them some protection from being frozen. Right. So yep. that's a good one. That is a good Another one. one would be an old fridge. Yeah. In fact, we used to have a neighbor who had an old fridge on her porch, and she would keep apples and pears in that, cracked open all winter long. And if it got too cold, she'd just go out and close the fridge door. Mm -hmm. And if it was a nice day, she would crack it open a little so it could get some, you know, circulation yeah, in there. Yeah, a little air circulation. And that worked really well it for It did. Her. And she was a long time. And she grew up right here. Oh, yes. Homesteading. 77, know, same, I think, yeah, year old. On the same land. And she didn't have a big giant root cellar. But yeah. she had tips and tricks like that that worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's really cool. Got her a long way. Yeah. Some people actually take old fridges or chest freezers and dig them into the ground. Yep. You can certainly do that, but you know, by the time you're digging into the ground, it, I kind of feel like you might as well just dig a little more and get a root cellar. Yeah, maybe, but but you know, depending on what your storage needs are, that's yeah. a good way to do it. And another start. thing you could do is is um, this is kind of like clamping, which uh -huh. we'll talk about in a minute, but you could stack bales around those, around mm -hmm. an old fridge or something like that. But getting back to just using some of what we have, there's right. a few other things that you can do here that keep you in that 50s range. And of course, a lot of this has to do with the environment that you're living in, right? right. So you're really just looking for where can I find a 50s range in a, in a way that hopefully your vegetables or fruits aren't going to go to, through a whole lot of daily temperature fluctuations. Right. So a little bit of insulation there. One thing that you can do is an exterior closet, yeah. um, maybe on your porch, that either does or doesn't have insulation, depending on how cold you get. Or you could insulate it, something like that, yeah. a shed, and yeah. insulate it. Again, it's going to depend on your environment, but you could insulate that shed, and that may keep it just enough, that, yeah. you know, in that good environment. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Really good. Uh, crawl spaces are another yep. really we've, good We've place. done that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a lot of times those will be exposed to the dirt. So you actually get the benefit of that dampness of the soil from underneath the house. And if you don't mind all the spiders and you can protect things from rodents. Right. So this is the non-ideal. It's a little harder to access depending right. on how much you're putting under there. Yeah. And, and we've done that. Yeah. And, you know, going down to the crawl space and what do you got? You know, you got to go out in the rain or whatever and yeah. crawl around to get to it. But it, it de definitely... 
uh, especially if the house floor is insulated. If it's a house with a crawl space and the house floor is insulated, it's going to often stay in those 50s, low 60s mm -hmm. and can work very, very well for you. Yeah, very yep. good. I have also seen that people take their porches and create mm -hmm. spaces underneath them, insulating with things like hay bales right. and just create kind of a mock root cellar underneath their porch in the shaded cool side of the house. Yeah, that well, can work well, you can even take the cool side of the house and stack up bales, you know, yeah. against the house so that inside that's getting a little bit of, uh, you know, heat from the house, but not that much. And then stack up, you know, straw bales or hay right. bales and make a little room. So you can really get creative with these things. There's a lot that you can do. But another one that's really good and what we're currently using is a basement. Yeah, our basement. If your basement is not heated, it is down in the earth. Yeah. And ours gets a little warm because the floors aren't insulated, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it can get a little bit warmer, but it generally stays in the low 60s, yeah. sometimes the 50s, depending on how it's doing. And um, that's a great space, especially if you can section it off. And here's what we're doing this year is we're actually going to create a little section and I'm taking a four inch vent pipe and gonna bring in with a fan and bring cool air in at night as we needed to get those temps down. Yeah. And that's gonna be a step up for us and in, in our system until we can get to that actual root cellar. Mm -hmm. So lots you can do in a basement. And to pick up the humidity, if you live in a dry area, I know in general, you know, basements kinda are notorious for being damp, but sometimes they actually aren't damp enough to be in that higher humidity right. area. You can always bring in buckets of water and just set them there mm -hmm. and let them evaporate into the area. Some people go down daily with spray bottles and just spray around. You can hang a sheet on the inside and dampen that hey, every day. I guess if you wanted to get really fancy, you could do a very simple mister. There you go. With a humid Tristan would love this, my son. He yeah. likes all the tech stuff. You yeah. Could, you could actually put a humidifier in there with a little mister and it just comes on a little bit yeah. when, when you need a little humidity. So you could probably put a digital controller on it for humidity. Well, you could do we're getting one for temperature thing. for the fan, is what there we're gonna go. do to, to help with that. So you can really get creative working with what you have, and which is what we've done over the years mm -hmm. to do your best to mimic these spaces. And yeah, okay, so we're not we're not hitting the ideals. We can really, really stretch out storage if you just get creative, learn a little bit and get very creative about thinking yeah. about the space that you have and how you can use it. There are some old fashioned <laughs> outdoor techniques, some mm -hmm. of which are like storing in your rows, actually not harvesting your root vegetables, but insulating over them. Mm -hmm. You also have the old bales. clamp system where you would pile up your vegetables and thickly insulate that with some straw. Um, and those things can definitely work depending on your environment. But right. I think any of these systems that you wanna come up with as an alternative, you have to keep in mind your top priorities when it comes to root cellaring. Number one, the first priority is temperature. Right. Okay, you've gotta get it cool. You gotta get it cool and you gotta keep it cool. And you wanna keep it as temperature stable as possible so you don't have a lot of fluctuation. Well, and, and if you can get that, start cellaring. However, however you can mm -hmm. start. Don't don't worry about the next one if you can't nail it, if you can't yeah. get that just right. If you can just get those cooler temperatures and even down into the low 60s, yeah. you're going to be able to, to take some of these foods and extend your storage without having to can them or dehydrate them or something else and just start playing with it. Yeah, absolutely. And then the number two priority is going to be your humidity levels. Mm -hmm. That's the second thing to try and dial in the best you can. Number three is gonna be airflow. Right. And of course, all of it, it has to be accessible. So you gotta think through accessibility. How are you gonna to get to it if it's covered in snow or if it's raining out or, right. you know, all of that. You need to kind of work through those issues because certain weather conditions in the winter can actually throw you off quite a bit from right. being able to access it. Yep. But that's uh, if you can work out those top three priorities, then you have a great alternative to yep. a traditional root cellar. Absolutely. And so one last item, yeah, which is maintenance. Is maintenance. And that is going through at least once a week during your storage period and sorting through things. Now, that's going to kind of change. Once a week is kind of that rule of thumb. But that's going to change as the season wears on. At the beginning, when you just put your apples into storage in a bin, you're pretty sure they're not bad because you were careful to put them all in, right? Well, I got to say, though, hopefully you're careful to put them all in. Right. And depending on how you're harvesting, who's helping you. Sometimes we've got a lot of kids helping. <laughs> yeah. So quality control isn't always at its tops. And so you just you, you've got to know what you're putting in. Right. And you may need to start, you know, right away going through them. OK, so I have to say that I'm really excited that this winter we're planning, maybe we're hoping, 
We're We're sure designing and making plans. I'm uh, implementation. We'll see. For a real root cellar, our first ever complete root cellar next year. We're hoping to put that in next year. We'll see. We've got a lot of projects. We're trying to do a lot of infrastructure projects on the property. And that's one of them that we really want to get in. Because you can store a lot of food really quickly in a root cellar, especially when you have a well-designed one. And so uh, you know, culturally, there was a lot more root cellaring going on because you had to survive off of what you were producing yourself right. a lot of times on the land. And that is a really, really good way to do that. A lot of the things that root cellar are kind of survival crops, right? Potatoes, yeah. carrots, uh, squash, things like that, that you can really get a lot of healthy, good calories out of for your winter time. So I'm really excited about that addition to the food program here on the homestead. Really is, and and but they're so important and that's why there are all those alternative methods. So find a way to get started yeah. and, and jump into it and start learning now and get in on that journey. Yeah, even if it's not ideal, just find yep. place, think about it, think about what you could do on your homestead and give it a try and some experimenting this year. Yep, absolutely. You guys, it's been great hanging with you this time and we will see you soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.